All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 930 session of uh, Linux Fest Northwest 2018. Is it 18? It's 18. It's been, it's been a long year. It feels like it's 2020 already. It's been the wrong year. <laughs> so this is, um, this is Watch Out for That Tree. Uh, it is a talk in which I ramble on about mountain biking and system software engineering uh, and kind of some of the crossovers that I've observed over the year. Uh, I am Jesse Keating. I'm the random tech guy up here talking to all of you. Um, if you want to contact me later, probably the easiest way, that's my Twitter handle. Um, it's very simple, at I am Jay Keating. And I apologize for why the screen is blinking, but we'll deal with it. All right, so um, I've been doing things with computers since the early 90s, um, back in my, my early childhood. Why are you doing that? Give me just a Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing tech since the 90s uh, as a kid, playing around with computers. Um, back in the time where if you wanted to play computer games with your friend who lived across town, your computer had to call their computer so that they could screech at each other uh, to deliver ones and zeros over analog phone lines. Um, looks like most of you probably remember that time. I was, uh, was hoping there'd be some young ones that would be, what? But um, anyway, um, I've also been biking since, um, since I was a kid, obviously, like most people grew up on two wheels. Um, but more seriously, as an adult since the, the mid, early to mid 2000s, back when Lance Armstrong was still everybody's hero. Not so much anymore. Um, I do work for GitHub, uh, but this is not a GitHub talk. Um, if you want to, t to yell at me about GitHub, <laughs> or pitch your, your pet feature or request, uh, or are curious about what it's like to work at GitHub, particularly in the site reliability engineering, um, data center, edge, uh, that sort of thing, um, come find me. Uh, I'm always happy to chat about things, um, but again, this is not really a, a GitHub talk per se. Um, I just happen to work there. Uh, and to get a couple other things out of the way, uh, yes, I'm using a Mac laptop. Yes, I'm using Keynote. No, I don't want to fight about it. All right. So I was riding my bike one day uh, down on some new trail. And it was not this bike, not this trail, but this is one of my favorite pictures of one of my bikes um, out in one of the, the trails near uh, Mount St. Helens. Um, <clears throat> but I wasn't really having a good time. Uh, I was getting pretty frustrated. Uh, the trail was unfamiliar to me. Um, I was running into a lot of things. It, was, it wasn't flowing. It was just jilted. And was, my bike was beating me up. Uh, and I just, I just wasn't having a good time. So I stopped for a couple minutes wanted to kind of center myself, reflect on what was going on, remind myself why I was out there, uh, think back about um, what were some of the things that, that I was taught as a new person out on the trail uh, and, and whether or not I should engage in some of those strategies. Um, and so I thought back to some of that advice uh, and it struck me uh, how many parallels there were between the things that I should do as a, a, a mountain bike rider um, and also as a software engineer. Uh, so some of the lessons that I've learned the hard way through many years of software and systems engineering um, could really translate to some of the things that I was taught when I was getting into mountain biking. So I've collected some of those here uh, and we're going to explore some of those parallels. Uh, and uh, also have an opportunity to look at some funny pictures. Because that's what everybody likes, right? Funny pictures? Right. So the first really important thing that you have to do on a mountain bike is you have to look up, right? Uh, if you're staring, if you're biking like the bike on the right, um, then you're going to miss this corner coming up. Right, until it's too late. So if you don't spend, if you, if you spend all of your time looking at the current mess that you're in, if you're really focused on what is this thing right in front of me, then you'll never see what's coming next and you'll never be able to prepare for it. Uh, 
If you just keep concentrating on what's right in front of you, you're just going to continue slamming into mess after mess after mess. So if you ride like the left, you'll never see that corner. Um, you'll slam on the brakes, maybe skid through the corner, lose a bunch of speed. Maybe you don't even see it early enough to hit the brakes and you enjoy a nice tasty bush for lunch. Um, but if you look up, you know, if you, if you trust what's going on in front of you, and you look up and see what's coming down the trail, you'll have a lot better opportunity to put yourself in a position to make that corner or to, to hit that feature, um, to ride smoothly through it. And the same goes for software engineering. Uh, if you keep your head up, if you keeping aware of what's coming next, if you plan ahead, then you can prepare yourself accordingly. If, if you're just moving from one disaster to the next, and you're trying to fix that disaster as best you can, but the way that you fix it just sets you up for the next disaster down the trail, then you're not going to have a good time, right? So, so it's always important to, to keep that head up, to look up, to plan for what's next, to kind of trust in the skills that you've built over time to get you through whatever it is that you're fighting and, and be prepared for that next feature down the trail. So aside from keeping your head up, uh, one of the next best things that you can do while riding somewhere unfamiliar is to follow somebody down the trail. Watching somebody who probably knows what they're doing work a problem can really help. You can see how they navigate the tricky bits. And if they happen to crash, you get a real good up-close example of how not to do something. Pair programming isn't just for software developers either. It's, it's super handy practice for systems engineers and operations and operators to, to follow as well. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with how part of your infrastructure works, but there's somebody else in the team that's really good at doing that, don't just let them handle all those problems and say, oh, I don't know that, that's, that's Jim's job or that's Sarah's job. Like, say, hey, can, can I handle this? Or can I, can I watch you handle this and see what it is that you do to fix this problem? Can we, can we share screens? Can, can you tell me the commands that I need to type to, to resolve this? Like, having somebody to follow is super duper handy. Um, you'll learn something, uh, hopefully they'll uh, learn something, and you'll be a better prepared for the next time that thing comes up and whoever is the expert in that area is just not available, right? So become a little bit more rounded, um, but you don't have to do it solo the very first time. So if you get an opportunity to, I, I highly recommend that, that paired programming, that following somebody through the sticky bits. But you don't want to follow somebody too closely. Because if you follow somebody too closely, you might make the same mistake that they do. <laughs> so this is kind of a combination of a couple things, right? <laughs> You gotta keep your head up so you see what's coming next. And, and you gotta like give a little space between who you're following and what you're doing. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody was okay in there. I don't know for certain, but um, I thought that was a really good example of, of not following somebody too close. Let's, let's see where things went wrong here. And there's plenty that went wrong. So you're following somebody you're unfamiliar with the trail, obviously, and they're moving at a pretty high rate of speed. And as you can see about this point, it's really not clear what's going on in this corner. You can kind of see that maybe it looks like there's some trail over here, um, and there's just a whole lot of like white <laughs> on the other side. Uh, might have been a good time to slow down. Uh, and, and kind of take a peek. And I think, yeah, so uh, I think the sign is trying to tell people something about this corner, but the sign is way, way too late. So this is kind of another uh, example of, of what mountain biking can tell us. Um, <clears throat> if we don't know that there's a problem until it's far, far too late, 
then there's no, no way that you're going to be able to, to handle that correctly. If that sign had been moved back quite a ways, uh, and you're being pretty good about observation and, and monitoring the trail in front of you, um, you'd have known that, hey, there's a problem. Maybe we should slow down and, and look at what's coming up before we just run blindly off the, off the cliff there. So don't follow too closely. Uh, and also, make be aware of what's going on on an unfamiliar trail. Conversely, you can have somebody follow you, too. Uh, so if you're the expert in something, or at least you think that you've, you've got a handle on it, and you've got somebody new to the team, or somebody who has previously not really taken advantage of or taking on any of these types of tasks, grab them. Have them follow you. Don't wait to ask. Say, hey, you know, I've got this, this thing coming up. It's low priority. It's not time sensitive. I'd really like to walk you through it so that maybe next time you could take it and I don't have to be the one to do that. So they can see how you're handling things. Uh, but also, they might point out observations you never would have seen before. Um, Explaining the process to somebody really helps bring to light things that are unclear, things that you've just sort of glossed over and moved on, but if you're having to slow down and talk it out, you might realize, hey, that's actually kind of weird. Maybe we should dive into that and, and fix it. Um, this is also known as like rubber ducky debugging. Um, talking a problem through out loud uh, is really, really handy. And the why, reason it's called rubber ducky is if you don't have somebody to talk to about your problem um, or about the thing that you want to do, uh, get a little rubber ducky, put it on your desk, pretend that that's somebody sentient and listening to you. Um, maybe you can sit it on top of Alexa, I don't know. Um, but just talk through it. And often you'll find that in the act of breaking down your problem so that you can put it into human words, uh, will unlock the solution in front of you. Like we, we think really good in concepts. Like I can I can easily imagine a, a a packet being constructed on this machine over here, transversing the wire, hitting a load balancer, load balancer making some decision, and routing it over there. Like I can think of those things visually, but having to word it out um, will bring to light a lot of the details that that you might miss. Uh, and it's those details that are really important as you're planning a project or debugging um, why this packet is constructed wrongly or why this thing is winding up on the wrong machine. So having somebody to talk to uh, or follow along behind you, really important, really good. So next really important thing is to slow down, right? Like, not every ride is a race. You don't have to be getting the, the Strava record for every single segment that you come across. Um, that ruins a lot of your day. Like If you're so concentrated on getting something done as fast as possibly can, you're going to miss the enjoyment of why you're even out there. <clears throat> they might be called code sprints, but they don't have to be races. Um, slowing down, keeping a setting pace, and, and not burning yourself out will let you finish the project and be ready for the next one, rather than just surviving the sprint and being completely spent afterwards. Um, when you're working in a group, nobody really likes the person who sprints ahead, or when you're riding in a group, I should say. Nobody really likes the person who sprints ahead as fast as they can, maybe to the top of the hill, maybe around the loop, whatever, and then sits there and has to wait for everybody else to show up. Um, you wind up riding by yourself if you're the person out in front and spending a lot of time sitting around waiting. Uh, the rest of the pack feels bad because like, they're making you wait, uh, but also because they can't keep up with you and they can't enjoy their conversation. It's best to find a pace that works for everybody in the group, uh, and then together you'll all have a much better time. It may not be the fastest that you can personally go, um, but you're not there to have a race, you're there to get you know, to, to enjoy the ride, you're there to get the project done, uh, but also to, to have a good time with it. Like, if you're just sprinting, 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 and then waiting for everybody else to get their parts done, um, you're burning yourself out for no good reason. Right? So find that good pace that fits for everybody on the team, um, 
work so that you don't burn yourself out on every little task. Uh, and you'll find that collectively you'll get more done uh, and you'll like each other a lot more after the words too. So, really important before you go out on a ride, inspect your gear, right? You can't operate on the blind faith that everything is perfectly functional and ready to go. Monitoring, observation, uh, feedback, all those things can go a long way to ensuring that the tools that you plan to use are production ready. Because if they're not, right, without solid monitoring and observation of what's going on, you'll find yourself needing to react to an emergency with no preparation. Right, so like, this guy has obviously got something going on with, uh, with his frame, it wasn't quite up to spec, hit a corner, his bike decided to go one way, he's trying to go the other, that's not gonna end well. Um, this rider uh, might be hard to see, but this bit's supposed to be connected over here, like the wheel's supposed to be under there, uh, he's not going much further down that trail. His wheel might, but, but he's not. Um, I don't know if he could have found the problem if he inspected it before the ride, uh, but he might have. Same kind of goes with, with software engineering. Um, if you're planning on using, uh, let's say you're planning on using GitHub for grabbing all of your sources during a build, um, and you don't quite realize that GitHub's having one of his rare outages, then your your tasks might grind to a halt. Um, or let's say that you're highly dependent on NPM for building out a whole bunch of node stuff. Uh, lo and behold, without your knowledge, you've needed left pad. And left pad gets moved or removed. Uh, you can no longer build any of your products because you've depended on all of those external um, sources of tooling to be there every single time you need it. Um, so having better observation about what your dependencies are to get your job done, you know, I depend on a frame, I depend on a, on a functioning fork, um, I depend on, uh, I depend on GitHub, I depend on NPM, um, I depend on, you know, PIP, PyPy, like having a good idea of all the, the, the dependencies that you have in order to get a task done, um, capturing all that, documenting all of that, and then setting up some observability around that uh, goes a long way. And in, in addition, if you, can, if you can identify all the different pieces of stuff that you depend on that are outside of your control and outside of your network, um, that becomes a nice little checklist of how can I remove this, uh, this dynamic piece, this piece that I have no control over, how can I remove that from my day-to-day -day dependency list? Can I archive that locally? Can I use archived artifacts? Do I have to build this every single time? Can I just notice that, hey, nothing's changed, grab the last build archive? Um, those are all really, really good things that can lead to a much healthier environment where you have fewer and fewer dependencies on things that are outside of your control. Not that GitHub would ever go down, right? It never goes down. You also need to know your limits. Uh, a lot of bike trails, they have what's called an entry feature. It's, or a gateway feature. Uh, it's, it's something that's really, really close to the front of the trail that kind of sets the tone for the skill level that's required for the rest of the trail. So if the first part of the trail is this gnarly wood bridge that goes up and has a 20 foot drop, and you're looking at that going, I'd like to go home now. Um, you probably shouldn't like skip that and try and do the rest of the trail. Because it's not just that piece that's gonna be scary. There's gonna be some other piece further down the trail that's gonna be just as scary and it's gonna come up really quickly and you're not gonna have time to bail and go around it. So they put those there to, to prevent somebody from hurting themselves um, further down the trail. Um, <clears throat> software projects, they don't necessarily have the same gateway feature, uh, but proper planning and discussion can kind of reveal what the difficulty level of a project is. 
and you really shouldn't take on projects that are that are too difficult to the point where you find yourself, you know, uh, staring at the ground in front of you where there should be a bike but there's not. Instead, it's about to be your face. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Like if you know that this thing is going to be challenging, um, identify the challenging bit. Ask around, is anybody comfortable with this? Is anybody familiar with this? Is anybody willing to give me a hand navigating this piece of it? Um, I'm not asking you to take on the whole project. I'm just saying, hey, help me with this little bit of it. Um, that's, that's really good. Uh, it shows the team that you're not infallible because nobody's infallible. Um, that's a healthy team. Uh, aspect. Everybody can admit where they have difficulty. Um, you'll be surprised to find where somebody's difficulty lies. You may think that they're like this wonderful genius who's been around for 50 years, um, you know, can, can rattle off the arguments to our sink and, and whatever with like the back of their hand, but it turns out they have very little idea of how to you know, debug a Python program or whatever, right? So um, getting to know where people's limits are uh, on your team is super healthy uh, and being able to, to partner with and pair with and work together to, to, to get past those things will really, really be good to help you push your limits, um, particularly when you have somebody there to help you. And kind of hand in hand with pushing your limits, uh, you need to be able to learn from failure. So. In the teams that I've worked on that have felt really, really good, and in, in the organizations that I've worked at that have felt really good, are the ones that, that celebrate failure, right? So they, they embrace finding the wrong way to do something, uh, and every failure is a learning opportunity. Um, I don't even really know how this rider failed. Uh, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Um, but what might be learned here is that uh, uh, sometimes having these types of shoes that stay clipped to your pedal might be uh, problematic in certain situations. So, so this rider might, might go back and, and either really work on their ability to become unclipped or maybe make the leap to, uh, to platform pedals and see if that works out better for them. Um, similar lessons can be learned from systems failures. Um, I think we've all heard of post-mortems, like, so site goes down, uh, there's an outage, Twitter lights up, everybody points at how awful this service is, um, something went wrong, right? So you have a post-mortem meeting, everybody gathers, in an in a unhealthy world, it becomes like the hunt for the root cause, whose fault was this, who can we put the dunce cap on, who can we take away the commit rights to? Um, who, what scapegoat can we find for this problem so that we can make a little blog post and say, oh, we found the problem, the, 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 the people that have, that have done this have been sacked, it won't ever happen again. Um, that's really unhealthy. Uh, it promotes this fear of trying anything, it promotes this fear of failure. Um, nobody wants to be the cause of the outage. Uh, and oftentimes people will hide what they're doing. Um, and find ways of working around the audit trail because nobody wants to be left holding the bag. Conversely, if you have a post-mortem that is not a somber event, like don't come to this angry, why did this happen? Why did you take down my precious thing? But instead, if you treat it like a party, if you treat it like a celebration, hey, we found this new way that our site is vulnerable. This is awesome. It's like a bug bounty, right? Let's, let's hunt down how this happened. Let's, let's catalog all the contributing factors. And let's turn that into a new set of tasks to focus on to make our site more healthy over time. And in fact, like, celebrate the, the fact that you found a new way that nobody had imagined to take down your site. Um, I was just at uh, <coughs> DevOps Days in Seattle in uh, one of the speakers, Allspa, um, had a really, really good take on a lot of this. 
I don't know if those videos are up yet, but I highly encourage grabbing the, his talk from, from DevOps Day Seattle. But one of the points that he was making is that um, there's almost never a true root cause to an outage. There might be like one of the last actions that happened or one of the, the triggering actions that happened. Like maybe somebody did push some bad code into production. But that's not really the root cause, right? Yeah, sure, that, that person put bad code out there and, and eventually things went bad. But why was that code that was clearly bad, how did that make it through the CI system? Maybe there's a gap in the CI that's not really testing the environment the right way. So that's a contributing factor. Uh, once it was out there, um, maybe a feature flag got reused that it was unexpected, and it turned it on far earlier than it was supposed to, right? So that's not the person's fault who wrote this thing. That's more of a fault of the system. So that's another contributing factor. And maybe there was a spike in traffic that weekend that, that nobody was expecting, uh, and something that was supposed to be touched maybe once or twice through the weekend got hit four million times, right? So that's a contributing factor. There's all these contributing factors that eventually lead up to a catastrophic event. And it's not, it's not the person who pushed the code's fault. Right? So there weren't proper guardrails. There wasn't proper observation of what's going on in production. Uh, there was unexpected traffic. There's all these different things that lead up to that. Um, those are the really interesting parts, not the little piece of bad code. Right? So that's... That's kind of one of his takeaways to that. Um, there was also a, a good story out there from a few years back about a high-frequency trading company that I think they lost billions in a weekend because of a, a, a unused or a, a dormant feature flag that got triggered for some code that wasn't supposed to be there that wound up uh, doing some really really bad things with automated trading. And so they lost tons of money in a very short period of time. Um, the, I wish I had remembered this and could put the URL, but you could probably find it with some proper Google searching of you know, high frequency trading company loses lots of money in short time, feature flag, something or other. It's an interesting read um, about how a series of unfortunate events leads to a catastrophic failure. But the key takeaway here is celebrate the failure, uh, embrace the ability to take down your site. Um, my favorite stories to talk about at the bar are the times that I've taken down large pieces of infrastructure. Because uh, in retrospect, they're kind of funny. Like, I did this silly thing, and oh my gosh, the whole thing blew up. Um, and it's fun to talk about after the fact. Everybody's got a story like that in some way, shape, or form. Um, celebrate those as a team. Don't shame them. So, alternate paths, right? So there's, there's often more than one way to get down a trail. Uh, trails are called single track a lot of times. There's room for one bike on the trail. Doesn't mean that there is a single path to follow down that trail. Surely there's a gate somewhere that this person can go around. There's, there's no need to throw yourself at it over and over and over again trying to make it through. The shortest path is not always the best path. So you might have this giant log that's right in the middle of the trail, and you can see some scrape marks on the top of it from people that have gone over and scraped parts of their gear on it. And you might think that that's the way to go, but it's big, and you gotta like really move your body and shift and all that stuff. But if you look to the left a little bit, <coughs> there might be a little roll around, there might be some rocks piled up that you can glide up and easy and over. Um, it just takes some observation. It takes some looking up. Uh, it takes some awareness that the straight path is not always the best path. So the same thing, when you're struggling with an engineering task, um, don't be afraid to look around. You don't have to use the same tools that everybody else is using. Um, you don't have to use the same methods that everybody else is using. You can find that alternate path that's going to be a little bit easier. Uh, and asking somebody who's been there before, again, some of those other lessons, right? So um, 
following somebody down that trail, oh look, they took the easy path, let's, let's do that. Or, or talking to somebody that's done it before, or like, having somebody follow you, and you know that that feature is like right at the edge of your capability, but the person behind you, you know they're never gonna make that feature. So you might slow down and stop and say, hey, there's this big thing coming up. And they're like, hey, what about that over there? You may have never noticed that, right? So um, all those previous lessons can really apply here too. Um, so this, this still is actually taken from uh, uh, a Danny McCaskill video. Uh, he was actually attempting to try and go over this fence to do a, a front flip over it. Um, he eventually made it, but with a lot of those videos that show like really amazing bike stunts that happen, um, what you don't often see is the hours and hours and hours of failure that led up to, to the perfect take of, of that thing. Um, same could be said for conferences that you go to. Like you go to a conference and somebody's sitting up on a stage talking about how they built this amazingly beautiful system for managing millions and millions of records or hundreds of machines or deploying 800 times a day. And like, it all sounds beautiful and you wanna go back to your workplace and make it happen. Often they don't talk about all the little failures along the way that they had to get through first before they can produce that perfect outcome. <clears throat> so if you haven't seen any of Danny McCaskill's videos, I highly recommend. They're, they're super entertaining. You don't have to be a bike guy or girl or person to appreciate them. They're just super fun. And he is pretty good about showing some of his failures too. So be aware of the environment in which you're operating in. This is again a bit of observe, observability, a bit of monitoring. Uh, environmental conditions can make things much harder than they normally are. If the environment that you're working in is not conducive to your planned activity, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been out when it's cold. But wood features like this, which you could normally get up and ride around a corner on, um, wood when it's cold and particularly a little bit wet gets super slick. Uh, and a thing that you'd normally be able to do if it was a bright sunny day and all dry uh, changes drastically when it's cold and wet and frozen. Um, pretty certain this was just like a gag, like making the shape of a person that's not an actual craft, but. It's still funny and it still uh, illustrates kind of the point. Um, if you're used to being able to do something in a nominal condition and you expect to be able to do that same thing when conditions are non-nominal, uh, you might have a really bad time. So if you, if you rely on say six or seven of your internal services to be up and functioning for you to deploy a new version of your software. What happens when three of those internal services are not nominal and you need to deploy a new version of your software in order to fix a bug that's preventing your site from working, right? So we play a game, we play a game at GitHub sometimes, which is, um, you know, let's imagine that these things that we care about are not functioning and our site is down. Can we get our site back up without our inventory service working? Can we get our site back up without Puppet working? Can we get our site back up without DNS working? Right, so these are all environmental things that you hope never happen, but they're gonna happen. You know, the old adage uh, is that it's not DNS, it can't be DNS. It was DNS, right? Um, same sort of goes for a lot of your internal services. Um, Role-playing that scenario, role-playing the, our money-making product is down. We have to get something new onto those servers and get them back up. Or we have to get new config onto the routers and get them back up. Um, but not only is that down, but like, this other data center is down where half of our internal services run. How do we get from this scenario to functional again? 
uh, playing those will help you identify a lot of the little things along the way that, hey, maybe we don't actually need to make an API, API call to ourself in order to get ourself back up. So like at GitHub, um, not surprisingly, we use Git a lot for some of the artifacts and some of the, the code pieces that we put out. And like, we tell our deployment system, I would really like to deploy this branch of this project out into production. Well, if that project is GitHub, GitHub, our big site, uh, and our deployment tool needs to talk to GitHub API to resolve the hash of a branch that we've given it in order to deploy that piece of code to the site. But our site's down, right? So we're depending on our site in order to deploy our site. Uh, if our site's down, we can't do that. So maybe we should not do that. Maybe we should have an escape hatch where we can give it the hash that we know because we've all got copies of the source code. We know that what this hash is. And we can get to the, to the Git daemon, we just can't get to the GitHub API. So what if we just have the ability to feed it a hash and skip the lookup? Cool, we've just figured out one way to remove a dependency from getting new code out the door for our main site. Play those games. Um, figure out ways to break your environment uh, that, that, uh, that will really stretch your thinking on how to get jobs done. And really, really, the most important thing to do while writing and while writing software and while deploying systems and while managing hardware and whatever is to have fun, right? Like, who doesn't want to have fun? Who doesn't like fun? Wouldn't it be great if everything you did during the day was fun? <laughs> if you're not having fun, everything's gonna suck. And if everything sucks, like, you're not gonna do it. You're just gonna find ways to avoid it. Um, you're gonna take it out on your family, on your dog, on, on whatever. Um, find ways to make the work fun and en engaging. You'll perform better, uh, you'll feel better about the work you're doing, you'll be a better teammate, um, and it'll keep the team healthy and happy. So, yeah, have fun. And the final thoughts, I'll leave you with this. Uh, my observations and my hobby, not gonna apply to everybody in the room, uh, but if you look into your own experiences and your own hobbies and your own things that you like to do in your pastime, I'm sure you'll find some parallels. Reflect a bit and ask yourself, what have I learned in my hobbies that I could apply to my day job? And conversely, what have I learned in my day job that I can apply to my hobbies? You'll probably be pretty surprised by how much crossover there is and how you can bend some words to make it fit. So thank you for indulging me in my silly pictures. Um, if you have any questions or comments, now is a great time. Um, I do have a small handful of GitHub stickers. I did not get my order in in time to have a bunch, but if you'd like a little Mona sticker, um, grab one while you can. Uh, oh, and I do have a book out on Ansible. Uh, if Ansible is a thing that's interesting to you, then buy my book. I'm just a short Google away. Fund my bicycle habit. It'd be great. So thank you. a challenging question. <laughs> um, I can tell an anecdote that's similar to that. Like, we had a we had a problem when I was at Rackspace. I was dealing with public cloud. We had to deploy software to say ten thousand machines, um, and we were struggling with being able to get all of them to have this archive of code in config. So we package up all of the OpenStack code plus all the Puppet manifests into a tarball and deliver the tarball. Um, we were having some difficulty getting that put out in a reasonable fashion. Uh, and we had this bright idea of 
using BitTorrent because there's a lot of a lot of bandwidth between all of these hypervisors, but not necessarily a lot of bandwidth back to a single web server. Um, so we demoed in in our pre-production environment. What if we use BitTorrent for distribution? It worked beautifully. Um, I like one of the other person was doing the pre-production stuff. Looked great. I fast followed them and pushed it into production. Um, without realizing that in production, with a lot more machinery, there were like network boundaries and there were uh, topper rack switches and routers and things that were between all of these machines. And the really interesting aspect of BitTorrent is when you start a BitTorrent client, uh, it will try and make as many connections as it possibly can to other BitTorrent clients that are out there. Uh, so when you have 10,000 of them all turned on at once, and they all try to connect to each other across all these boundaries. Uh, and we did 500 times the theoretical connection limit of some of our networking gear um, before they failed. And then they failed. And so we took out an entire region of our public cloud by trying to use BitTorrent. Um, because it, it worked in pre-prod, why wouldn't it work in production, right? So um, that was sort of a fast follow uh, there wasn't really a mistake that was made in the, in the pre-prod. So it was a little more of a, of a know your environment thing as well, but certainly a, a spectacular failure.